in really general terms about two little bits of one big patch um, and those two little bits are about my attempts to avoid modelling musical type. Um, so I'll play you a little bit. Avoid? Sorry? You said your attempts to avoid yes. modelling. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, so, uh, and we'll, f we'll find out why. It's partly laziness and partly fear. Um, <laughs> partly philosophy. So I'll play you a little bit of the of the piece that this is about, um, and then we'll get dirty. <clears throat> I'll turn my volume up. So in that thing, as in quite a lot of my things, um, I'm quite ambivalent about whether I'm making an instrument or whether I'm making an artificial co-player um, or whether I'm making anything as grandiose as work. Um, rather, for me, a lot of live electronics is about exploring the vague territories between those things. Um, so, whilst George Lewis, for example, was very clear when he made Voyager that he was trying to make, in a very overloaded sense, some kind of co-player, um, and he had some quite clear ideas about what he was trying to pack into that thing, um, I want something that sometimes has the directness um, of a kind of instrumental thing, and other times is sort of producing his own gestures and throwing back at me. Um, and as George Lewis points out, <clears throat> there's a kind of, there's an infinite regress when you start making any kind of um, system that's supposed to make its own utterances, in that it's easy to get trapped into this idea that you need to make a model of music in its entirety and somehow capture that in your Max Batch um, and, <clears throat> uh, and sort of proceed from there. Um, so quite a lot of the way that I work is trying to avoid getting caught into this, into this mental trap. Um, and that's kind of why I like using the, the edges of algorithms and the points of breakdown as, as compositional boundaries because it makes a set of decisions for you um, that, that you can then explore. So my patch isn't as nice as Rod's. Sorry. It's quite nice. It's quite, oh yeah, it's sort of like... There's so many sending and receives in there, which is a bad code smell to start with, that I just sort of ended up having to use colour coding to, um, to find out what was going on. So there's only two little bits, really, that I think are interesting enough to share. A lot of this, a lot of this is actually the kind of bookkeeping that, um, that Alex was talking about. A lot of this is just to make sure that stupid stuff doesn't happen, um, or at least the wrong kind of stupid stuff. First thing I want to maybe I should give a bit of view. All right, all right. Um, what I see when I'm playing isn't isn't this mess. I just see this mess, um, and the idea is that there should be so little to look at that I shouldn't need to look at it. Um, 
So you've got some nice brightly coloured buttons that let you know <laughs> like whether it's on. That sort of thing. Um, and then these dots at the bottom. In principle, the computer has three voices. Um, and in principle, they should be sometimes um, working some kind of counterpoint with each other. And there's a sort of, there's a proto score. Because um, one of the things I was interested for in this piece was starting to try and combine um, having some kind of pre thought fragments as motifs with that kind of more in the moment um, processing. Um, and there's quite a lot of this patch, having watched all Danielle's ninja stuff bark yesterday, I think, ah, oh, I could make the patch about that big and uh, using bark, it would be great. But at the moment, it's kind of cobbled together um, out of all kinds of bad things. So there's three jitter matrices um, which have movements in them. Um, and they load up um, around here. Um, they then spent spawn events um, as you're um, going on. And it's the spawning that is um, all the rate at which things get spawned, which is the first thing I want to talk about. So I wanted, um, this is in a previous piece I first used this trick, I wanted to have different clocks, but I didn't want to commit to having subdivisions of those clocks. I wanted them to be related. Um, I wanted them to be non-metrical in some way. <coughs> I wanted them to move around. Um, and it's an interestingly large number there, isn't it? Um, two things infected me. One was reading a, um, a piece by David Casale, who had an improvising system for the <laughs> who said, actually, we should get rid of the idea of time in time. It's, it's an unmusical concept. Um, and started think, thinking about how he's going to build this improvising system without any explicit concept of time, which I thought was quite interesting. Um, and then a little later on, there's a book by a, a drumming phenomenologist called Tiger Roholt, um, called Groove, a phenomenology of musical nuance. Um, and it's a really, really interesting book. Um, and in it, he takes quite strong issue with a lot of the research about musical groove. Um, it starts off with a kind of ontological supposition that the best way to think about groove is in terms of deviation. So you start off with the idea that true musical time is somehow on, on some sort of grid, and then you start to theorize any sort of expression or feel in terms of um, deviation from an ultimate truth. And he's saying, no, you need to turn that on your head. It's the grid that we've made up, um, and it's, it's the interactions between different musical um, layers that give, give rise to group. Um, and I thought that was quite interesting. So I thought, well, if I want different streams of time to go on, and I don't really want to think in explicit terms about how those thing, things relate, what's the cheapest <coughs> way of getting there? This is one of the cheapest ways of getting there. So, some housekeeping. <coughs> I might take this filter out, it seems un un unnecessarily playing itself. Um, the action is in this abstraction I've got called acg.gat. Pulse follow. I'll talk you through it. The first thing I do, well, the, over the overall story is that I decide that. <coughs> I can get away with thinking explicitly about the relations of, uh, relationships between these things by deciding that my, my rhythmic groove is somewhere to be found in my audio signal um, if I downsample it by an absurd amount and then try and find periodicities um, within the downsampling effect. Um, but I didn't want to be too polished about it. Um, and I think this version might actually be slightly too polished. Um, so I downsample by a factor of 2048. Um, I like the <laughs> I know, and that, that's why I regret that filter outside the abstraction now. <coughs> Actually, it's, you know, who needs that? Uh, the interest is in the A's, I'm sure. Um, and then, actually, I can do this better with frame lift now. Um, quite easily, sort of. 
do this kind of resampling. But this is just building up a list, essentially, um, of a massively subsample signal. So now I have something at a massively low sample, um, sample rate, which I'm hypothesizing um, might have time. Um, interesting things to say time about it. Then the rest of this really, these next few bits, are just what's required to try and do an autocorrelation calculation in JSA. Um, so what autocorrelation gives you, um, Alex is going to want to look in that sub in a second and critique. I can't <laughs> You'll see. <laughs> um, so autocorrelation you can think of as a representation of the signal that gives you peaks putatively where there are periodicities to be found in the signal. Um, so at a normal audio rate, it's a cheap and cheerful way of doing pitch tracking. Um, and you can get there, I can't remember how you get there. Uh, transpires that you get there by doing the inverse FFT of your magnetic spectrum. So that's the quick way of doing it. Um, that's not really so interesting as what you end up with. Um, there you go. So actually, before I've done any tidying up, yeah. we end up with some nice bands. And each of these bands, I think this is a kind of time axis moving, moving along horizontally. And these are peaks, um, so that there might be some kind of period issue there. And you can see it's quite noisy. Um, and really, the remaining decisions are about how much of that noise to try and, um, to try and tidy up. Um, the answer is probably not, <coughs> not too much. What's the, what's the input you're giving at that moment? The input will be probably my laptop. Yeah, my laptop mic. Oh, is it? Okay. Yeah. Um, so now I've made it sad by slapping my laptop mic. It will come back. There's a huge lag as it has to prepare 256 samples down sample by 2048. Somebody else, somebody could work out how long that is. But okay. it has to build up this buffer and then, and, and, and then get going. So it's sl slow to respond. So by the time you get out of this, these, <coughs> these are my clocks. So these are all um, different rates of metronome that I can then call on in different parts of the case to say, okay, I want my, my quickest clock is that, is that low one down there, it's jumping around. My slowest clock is that one um, jumping around at the top. Um, and I found in practice that um, it's like playing with a bad improviser, this thing, which is quite nice. I quite like playing with bad improvisers. Um, it's, so, sometimes I have a kind of low, a low bar that I set myself in these interactive pieces, which is better than random. Um, and <laughs> it's just about made it over, over the fence, it's better than random. It's definitely better than just slapping in a load of random objects attached to metros um, and doing that. And it's certainly more interesting, I found, than um, trying to pre-compose a bunch of subdivisions of, of clocks or something for a situation that I deliberately wanted to be underdetermined as I went on stage. Um, as I was saying on the first day, I quite like it if, if consequences arise due to the way that I'm playing. This is what, one way that it happens. So, it, it will utter, and it, but it won't utter in a comp completely predictable way. But it does feel like it's got a connection to it. Um, and I've made no attempt to justify that beyond the fact that it just seems to work. There's not, there's not a sound theoret theoretical basis or engineering basis for doing this. Hello, Alex. Do you, do you feel the lag now that I've calculated what it is? Do you feel it? <laughs> it's about 12 seconds. It's about 12 seconds. It's about 11.9, yeah. No, because none of, I mean, none of the things that these clocks are really responsible for are, are supposed to be immediate. It, this is supposed to be to do with... But do you sometimes feel like that you do something and after about 
10 seconds or so, it starts to kind of come into sync with, like, if you do a kind of cyclical thing, or do you just... If I do, what now? <laughs> okay, that's my question. Thanks. <laughs> I'll try next next time I, I play a gig. I'll try and do the same thing twice. And we'll see what happens. Twelve seconds, he said. Yeah, excellent. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Okay. Um, the second thing, um, and I thought this would segue nicely into the much more sensible things we showed yourself to do, was a similar approach to segmentation. Um, and like many parts of this patch, this was bolted on in a slightly ad hoc way moments before a performance, because that's where you get all the best ideas. Um, <laughs> um, some, you know, sometimes during the performance. Yeah. Um, the very first version of this, um, this patch, was trying to do two things at once because I had two colliding deadlines. I needed to make an installation piece and I needed to, um, to do a premiere. Um, and both the installation was open on the same day as the premiere. So I thought, okay, I'll make, I'll make one kind of um, casual max framework and then I'll, I'll, I'll deal with the full now. Um, and the installation piece was a very long form thing. It was running, it was running for a couple of months. And that was, that was all about kind of consuming the sound of its environment and then sort of burping it back up um, every now and again. Um, and one of the things it needed to decide was how often to try and record something out of the environment and on, on what basis to do that. Um, and I felt for the first version of that, it wasn't very satisfactory. It was kind of, there was a lot of hacking and sort of don't do it too often and sort of try and make some kind of fairly lo-fi judgment about what's interesting. Um, but then this idea of um, trying to capture a, an interestingness feature um, in the most in the most vague sense possible, um, was quite it was quite in in and of itself interesting. Um, how would you model that without getting overly committed um, to a set of ideas about what might happen, particularly in the installation context? Um, you don't know what's going to be passing through that space, and you don't really want to know what's going to be passing through that space. Um, so what I came up with for the second one was. Um, just a small abuse of, of neural networks, a, t a tiny abuse. Um, and now I need to find it in the mess. Right, I think I have found it. So one thing to say, for the um, actual big piece, so the performance piece, I have one buffer that is the same duration as the piece that fills up the things that get captured as I, as I go on. So if I'm, that's a 14 minute buffer, and things, things will get thrown in there. And the decision the patch has to make is, uh, is when to do the throwing in. Well actually, to be, to be fair, it just fills up. What I'm capturing is markers. So it needs to decide when something interesting enough to, to throw down the marker is happening. And again, I did want to, commit myself too much to deciding a priori what might count as interesting. Ah, this is the messy version. You see it all breaks down. The facade of neat colours and, and what have you just vanishes as soon as we see the bit I added before the gig. Right. This isn't as bad as it looks. I'll zoom in and then it won't be that bad at all. So the first thing that goes on, the magic is here, in this object called F Echo Online. Um, and this um, houses something called an echo state network. Um, an echo state network is one of my favourite kinds of neural network because it's really, really grungy. Um, normally, in a neural network, you have a bunch of things that are all connected to each other and you want certain outputs in response to a certain input. And a lot of the work is in arranging masses so that happens. So you train it. And the traditional way of training is that you adjust the strength of the connections between every single point in the network over and over and over and over and over and over again until it starts to behave the way that you want. 
Echo State Networks come from an alternative approach um, called Reservoir Computing, which says <coughs> you can actually get rid of a lot of this work by treating uh, most of these connections just as a kind of random medium you're pushing stuff through. And then you only train a little slither um, right at the very end. I'll try and find you the diagram from somewhere. Um, And the point of this is, this is what this, this is why it's called reservoir computing, uh, is that <coughs> you treat um, most of um, the connections. All this grey stuff is what they call the reservoir, and this never gets adjusted in training. The theory is that you have a big enough pool of randomly connected stuff, uh, then actually the only thing you ever need to train is a set of connections right at the output. Um, and depending on how bothered you are, um, the bigger you make that, the more consistent the output will be anyway, just because it tends to converge to, um, to a point. So you have different random instantiations that will produce more or less the same effect. So actually this makes training much, much, much cheaper. And for small problems where you need a kind of quick response, um, you get a different kind of tractability. So you sort of trade off some of the magic that you get with deep learning for a kind of grid of quickness. Um, even more remarkably, someone then found out that you don't even need this gigantic pool of ran randomly connected stuff. Um, you could actually make it even simpler by having a completely deterministic layout of neurons. So this is just basically a circle of things in feedback with each other. And they found out you could get almost as good results with that, and that actually gives you even less computation to do. So rather than having a gigantic mess of um, things that are arbitrarily connected, you have to kind of push all your data through it. So this is like basically just a delayed feedback network with some, with some many good ones. So it's only one layer? One layer, yeah. Um, and <coughs> Under certain conditions, because you've still got the recurrence, so it's important, but you've still got the yeah. feedback, it still has enough of the memory. So you still need to make it big enough that it's not linear enough that it can start to capture um, things, with that, uh, things that are going on. Um, but with that cheapness um, comes the idea that actually I can run this at sample rate. Right um, and that's where the, the attractive thing um, for me was that so I can just start throwing sample by sample by sample and into this thing. Um, so taking some work already done by Chris Kiefer, he made a PD object to do the kind of vanilla um, echo state network <coughs> a few years ago. Um, I ported it over to Max and then implemented this simpl simplification um, where we've just got a kind of uh, a, a ring of these neurons in, in feedback with each other. Um, and I made this thing, which so far I think exposes precisely zero adjustable parameters to the outside world, um, which isn't normally my way. Um, and that basically attempts to be a one sample predictor of its, of its input signal. And so you just you throw anything in there and it just tries to guess what the next sample is. Not, not very sophisticated. Um, and then, <coughs> here, Basically, because I've um, standardized my output data, so I've adjusted it by its median standard deviation, um, I'm saying any time, oh, I should say, the output of this thing is its error. It's not, um, it's not actually the predicted signal. So I'm getting, I'm getting how wrong it is coming out of there, which I then standardize, and I then threshold um, based on the number of standard deviations of wrongness it is. So if it's six standard deviations wrong, I've decided that is my concept of interesting at this time scale. 
Again, this is an unprincipled set, but an interesting one. So there you see, I'm getting something that at the fast time scale is kind of giving me a regular but not completely random first pass idea of where to put some segments. But they're still quite quick. For the purposes of this piece, I'm, I'm, I want a gestural time scale, I don't want um, an onset time scale. So I do another pass of the same thing. Sorry, this is where the mess comes in. Um, back down at message rate. So I debounce. I just say, I'm going to throw away any interval that's less than 200 milliseconds because I'm, I'm just not interested. Hello. Five minutes. Wow. Um, and <clears throat> having done that, we take snapshots and we get a couple of numbers. Then, I model the energy in that period of time, so I just use Alex as a descriptive <coughs> object to capture the amount of energy just in that window since bang one and bang two. And then I do the whole mess again. Um, so I, I standardise that, I um, divide by the standard deviation, I subtract the mean. Um, I do the lowest phi way of actually trying to get some kind of um, vague hope that it won't blow up in performance by <laughs> throwing away big numbers. And then I run into a message rate version of the same object. Um, so then the same thing happens, it tries to build a one step predictor of the way that the energy is evolving between unequal sized chunks. Um, so the first pass yields burps at different rates. I model the energy in those burps. This then tries to predict how that is evolving over time. Then I do the same trick of tracking the error of that and deciding the amount of interest when it exceeds a certain number of standard deviations. And that finally yields a bunch of events that I can put slices in a cull of interestingly different, um, uh, different lengths. And the thing that I like about this is actually I get a, I get a real range of, of different durations. So I throw, I'm throwing away there anything less than half a second because it seemed out of keeping with the pace of the piece. But thereafter I get anything between about half a second up to 12 seconds. And as with the pulse thing, there is this feeling that even though it's not capturing phrases or gestures in any kind of principled way, it's doing something a bit like it. Um, and a bit like it, I think, is the kind of territory that I like to, I like to occupy. If I wanted something that thought properly musically, then I'd find some more Cuban collaborators <coughs> to, to play with. Um, I think one of my attractions to computers is exploring the ways in which they're a bit shit. That might be the punchline. Maybe I'll start there.